You know, I gotta tell you a funny story. We, uh, last, a couple weeks ago, you know, I, I had reached out to Rob and I said, you know, hey, can you, uh, can you come in and, and be a speaker for the Brokers Open this week, or, you know, this month? And he was like, eh, he's, not, he's not very big on public speaking for hour long stretches. He, like, he likes short spurts. So he was like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. Well, why don't you get me some questions? And I said, yeah, not a problem, I'll get you some questions. So I still haven't given him the questions. But I do have some questions lined up for him. Um, I'm gonna kind of let him, let him do his thing. And I, uh, I know, you know, obviously he's the president of our company. Um, he's been a great friend of mine for many, many years. You know, I, I remember when I first started as a manager, he was like the guy in the back of the room cracking jokes during manager meetings. And then he, uh, you know, he quickly became, he was, in all honesty, he was one of the top producing managers in our company, um, quickly became a, a regional vice president. Maybe not quickly on his end, but from my perspective, it was pretty quick. And, um, you know, he was my regional. And as a regional, I, I could tell you, I mean, you could speak to this better than most, but um, I was a mess as a manager. Like, I, I didn't have great systems. I didn't, um, you know, I was pretty good at, at the human part of it and being able to, to go back and forth and, and help my agents grow. But uh, I really wasn't great at the, at the management side of it. And he definitely came in as a, as a leader and, and really kind of guided the way for me on that. So I appreciate all of your efforts on that front. Uh, definitely learned a lot from the man. And then he became president. And it's, uh, I, I really think that from my perspective as a manager, I, uh, you know, I always want, you want people that, that lead and put their people first. You want people that are forward thinking when you think of our company. And I, I know nobody that I could speak to that, that fills both of those roles better than Rob. So without further ado. Ooh. I really didn't think he was going to stop talking. Is this on? Uh, I never know if this thing. I could talk loud even if it's not on. I, no, no, no. That's not. No, that's a mic for the recording. This oh, just is the recording? Mic. I don't need that. You guys can hear me, right? First of all, I take no credit for what Michael has turned into. <laughs> Just for those agents in the Maplewood office, if, if you think like he's got his, his shit together now, picture what he was like 14 years ago. Um, yeah, it's funny. As, uh, uh, I wish I was joking. No, he's, you're doing great. You're doing great. The, um, it's funny. He talks about four, it was 14 years between the start of management before I became the original vice president. So there was a long time of that. And then it was about eight years of real estate sales and management before that. So I think I'm celebrating 27 years or 28 years in the real estate business this year. So it has been a long, long grind. And I think we kind of titled this, the questions that Michael was supposed to send over was supposed to be just some leading questions that, you know, to really just get this as a conversation between all of us as to what's going on in the real estate industry. I mean, there's news every day. There's disruptors every day there's shifts in the market occurring every day and how do we do it and sometimes we as a company probably look like we're going in the wrong directions to the agents that might work here or even to the employees that work here and then once you kind of understand what the changes are you realize that we're getting ahead of a lot of things that need to happen so I'm, I'm here to hopefully answer some uh, promised softball <laughs> questions from Michael and uh, obviously have a conversation I love that we have so many managers because I know you have is probably as many questions as we might and the, by the way Zach Lasella is here in the back I'm gonna call this out for a second. He's our, he's our newest manager of the team. He's taken over the Wyckoff office uh, among some additional responsibilities. I'm thrilled to have you. I've known him now for, has it been five years? About five years. And uh, it's been a long time in coming for him to take over an office. So, uh, but yeah, as far as that goes, I'll start the conversation early. And with what I usually say to everybody in the room is I'm a realtor. I'm not a corporate guy. I don't work in this building. I think this is probably my fifth time in this building this year. Uh, I sold houses, I listed houses, I come direct, directly from the real estate sales side of things. And yes, I can shift um, what we need as an agent. I feel like I'm an advocate for you. I'm an advocate for the managers when it comes to this building. I think, you know, we have a lot of changes. As uh, so if you heard some yesterday, did you all see these, you know, releases? Happy to answer questions on that too. Uh, with those changes, and my job is to be an advocate for us, to be the voice of, you know, real estate brokerage in the room. And uh, you know you have an advocate because uh, I have a hard time staying quiet. If you think Michael talks a lot, uh, <laughs> you might not be getting out of here on time because you got me. But I'm happy to answer. So Michael, anything you want me to lead so, on, I'm happy yeah, to I'm go. Gonna, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions at you. Let's, let's get the ball started early on. Um, you obviously, your father was a broker. 
And you know, we're gonna start with where real estate was and where it's, it's gone now. And I don't think that this changed so much, but I'm curious, you told a story the other day that I think is worth sharing. You were sitting in front of a computer. Uh, yeah, Jimmy Rose has since stolen that story and made it his own, but it definitely was me. Um, hey, Ben. The, um, it was interesting. Yeah, I started back in, the, I mean, I, gosh, I grew up in a real estate office. My whole life has been in a real estate office. There are agents in our Mountain Lakes office who actually can honestly tell the story of changing my diaper on a copy machine in an office. <laughs> it's slightly embarrassing that she's still with the company, but yes, that's, that has happened. Um, so I, I've lived real estate my whole life, and I remember I came, I you know, worked on it in college when my, I did an internship my junior year and I was falling short on credits to graduate on time. As my father had said to me, he said, I, as I explained to him, I might need a fifth year. He said, that's no problem at all. And I was excited by the prospect of a fifth year in college. And he was like, I pay for four. I was like, oh, sh <laughs> oh shoot, like I better figure this out. So I, you know, took some summer classes over at Montclair and I did an internship. I started a referral company. So uh, by the end of the summer, I think we had about 500, 600 agents in a referral company. And that was great because we built it to uh, feed leads and into what eventually became your company that you were running over there. Leading Edge Referral Associates was something I started on a summer internship. I think it's still running and I think Rob bought that from us as well. But uh, it was something that we had started. It was great. I took my $100 on every transaction and it went into a a certain social fund for my college. But I grew up in this family and in real estate and I remember coming out of it going, I wasn't gonna do this. I wasn't gonna do it. I loved it and I knew it, but I wasn't gonna do it. But I didn't know what it was gonna be. And then I got my license and I loved it. I, I started in the office. So I remember sitting there and I, I kind of hit the ground running. There's a gentleman in Rockaway who still refers to me as Flash. Um, he's, you know, because I had, I think I made circle of excellence in my first six months and I had become number one in my market in a year or so. and. He said, there's a lot of people who have been this flash. They, they, you know, you, you burn bright in your first, I'm talking about Rick, by the way. Uh, you burn bright in your first year and then uh, you, you just fizzle out. You, you know, we'll never see you again. So whenever he sees me, he still refers to me as flash. It's 27 years later, hopefully still burning. But I, I remember the situation and I was sitting in an office and this probably tells a lot about real estate. I remember I was working with a client, if anybody's local to Mars County, uh, there's an Anthony's Pizzeria in the middle of Rockaway and Rob Carmagnola is a wonderful guy and he was looking for a buy level in White Meadow Lake. And we all know where, what they go for. It was the price point, you knew where it was. And I sat in front of a computer and my father was in the building and he walked by when he walked in in the morning and I was at this computer and he went upstairs. A couple minutes later, I can hear his ankles crack. I always knew where my father was because his ankles cracked so he could, never, he could never sneak up on us. And I hear him walk by again and he goes down and I'm still on the computer. And about an hour later, he comes by and I'm still working on the computer and he finally looks at me and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for a, you know, a house in White Meadow Lake for Rob Carbignoli, he wants a buy level. And then he comes, he goes upstairs and he goes, hmm. That's the way he would do it, hmm. <laughs> Great, well, I, hear, I just heard it, it still, still shakes. The, um, so he comes down about 15 minutes later and he goes, what are you doing? I said, ah, I still haven't found anything. He goes, it's not my question. He goes, what are you doing? And I go, I'm looking for the house for Rob. He goes, that's not my question. And I said, what? I said, what's your question? He goes, what are you doing? Waiting for somebody else to list it? And I sat there and it was that moment of pause where he said that to me and I just went, damn. Like, I felt that big because well, ultimately what was I doing? I was waiting for somebody else to list it. I was doing the same thing that every other agent was doing, looking in the MLS for somebody else to list that property. And I think that was probably the turning point in my uh, real estate career was I didn't wake up in the morning looking in the MLS, waiting for the listings. Right now we, we have a, a real estate shortage. We have inventory shortage. I think they say that statistically there's about 4 million homes short for what we should have it to be a balanced market right now. And we're all waking up in the morning, maybe not all of us, but most of us are waking up in the morning having a buyer who knows exactly what they want and where they want it. And we're disappointed that there's no houses on the market. Effectively, you're 22 year old Rob sitting in front of a computer waiting for somebody else to list that house. And I would say that would be something that I would say evolutionary change in real estate is don't do that. You know, this inventory is not gonna come back on the market as easy. And if it is, there's gonna be 18, 20 offers and lines out the door at the opens, which is great. But get out there and get those listings because that's, uh, you, you, you uh, sitting around waiting, there's a lot of, by the way, you're not the only ones anymore. Big change in real estate. I'll probably steal some of your softballs and just tangent my way through them. But, all right, cool. So, um, but one of the things you think about is back in the 90s, we, had, we, were the, we were the controllers of information. Who here has been licensed since like early 90s? Who remembers the MLS books, you know, $250 fines if they fell into the hands? Like, gosh, I go back to when it was like pieces of paper we had to put in binders, you know, and like with one key that you like opened every lockbox. Um, we had the information and it was actually said you were fined if you get, if that information got to the hands of the public and now we have the internet. So meanwhile, while you're in the office every day looking and waiting, 22 year old, just want you to think of 22 year old Rob, he was a really great guy. Um, it feels like it was yesterday. 
But um, if you're 22 year old Rob waiting for them, guess what? The homeowners are doing the same thing. They're sitting in front of a computer every day waiting for that house to come on. And how fast is, what's RET standard now? 15 minutes between sitting in the MLS and hitting Zillow? Like real estate transmission standards, that's 15 minutes. They're gonna have that information before you do because they're gonna be on that computer as fast as you. So if you think the value that you bring to the consumer is gonna be you know, your ability to locate that home for them, you're not. They're gonna locate that home on their own. You, know, you have to figure out why you need to be the person that they reach out to when they find that home. And that's something that has severely changed and significantly changed you know, in the last 20, 30 years. All right, so you love to tell the monkey story. The monkey story. <laughs> And I want you to tell the monkey story, and then I, I, want to, I want you to tell me what you got rid of and why. Which, which monkey are you? Oh, you're monkey talking ladder. about the ladder. Okay, I got two monkey stories, by the way. <laughs> I never, I've never realized that as I had this, they're like, tell me a monkey story. I'm like, I got four stories. I don't have a lot of stories. I know which one it is. I, I got rid of them. But I do, I have multiple monkey stories. Um, mostly, and actually one of my favorite monkey stories, I was in a bus accident when I was a little kid. And that was, this is not even the topic of real estate. This will be the first time you hear this monkey story. The, um, you wouldn't have two monkey stories. I have three. So I may have more. But I was in the bus. My bus was in an accident. And I was a, kind of a knucklehead growing up, as you might imagine. And I was in the back of the bus. And we got T-boned by a car uh, coming down a hill. And accident happens. And we all, you know, I opened the back door. And I got all the kids off the bus. I, you know, the police were there. We had all the people. And my little sister, she, I was probably in seventh grade. And that makes her probably third grade with bawling, crying. Uh, Chipper, you know, Chipper was missing. And Chipper is like, she was there like, is Chipper a dog? She's like, no, is Chipper your little brother? No, she's crying, the cops are there. I'm like, Chipper's her monkey. <laughs> Chipper's her stuffed monkey. She left it in the bus when she escaped the bus. So by the way, that's my, that's my far, that's not the story? All right, go to another one. My sister lost her baby monkey, so that's monkey story, monkey story three. Um, I'll give you all of them. A monkey story two is honestly something even that we can look at it when it comes down to a lot of things. I teach this to managers a lot. It was something we learned in Blueprint. I know I look at Jerry, he went through Blueprint. Um, Dave Horowitz taught a lot about you know, monkeys and saying everybody that you come across in your life has a monkey on their back that they want to give to you. You probably have that with consumers. You have it with managers. You can all look at it and be like the agents that will come into the office and the, uh, you know, the agents you're going to have it with. Like your mortgage rep is going to try to dump stuff on you, your title. Everybody has a monkey and, you're, and to be effective in the business, you have to realize which monkeys you need to take and that's the stuff that you own and you, can't, you take from them and you let that, you lighten their burden because they need that. And the other one is you need to help them solve their, take their own monkey and solve their own problems. So that's monkey story too. I use that. You've heard me give that story too. But the one that he wants to talk about, number three, here's the story you want. So there was a study in the 1980s, and this is really to my leadership style and I, my first challenge when I came into this role was um, there was a psychological study and they put basically three monkeys in a, in a cage. And they put a ladder and they hung grapes from the, the, the ceiling, or bananas or grapes, whatever fruit it was. And they basically, you know, the monkeys did what monkeys would do, and they immediately went to run up. And they got water jetted with, like, freezing cold water. And those monkeys, every time they went up this ladder, anybody hear the story yet from me? Oh, good, I got some people like, rookie. <laughs> Sharon's raising her hand. She's heard it, like, 18 times. Um, so they water jetted these monkeys, and eventually these monkeys learned that you don't eat those fruit that are hanging from the hook, and they would slide, like, some food through a, you know, a hole in the wall. A couple months later, they introduced a second series of monkeys, and those monkeys did what you expect monkeys to do. They would run up the ladder, and the first series of monkeys like grabbed those monkeys and were like, no, get back down here. Like, you don't eat that, you eat the food that comes through the hole, and they teach that. They then took the first generation of monkey out for good, and they introduced a third set of monkeys. The second generation of monkeys took the third generation of monkeys and taught them the same behavior. So they took the second generation out. The third generation of monkeys sat in this room, fruit hanging that they would love to eat, hanging from a hook, but they didn't eat it. They waited for the food to come through the door. And the, the idea behind the study is what they said was the, um, they, the third generations of monkeys never got water jetted and they never directly came into contact with the monkey that had water jetted. It was a learned behavior of what they do because of something that happened long generations ago in that study. And honestly, that's the same thing that happens to us in the real estate business and us as a company when I came in here. So I refer to it as bananas, because I, I used to say there's bananas hanging from the hook. And when I sat down with Dan and Tracy and all the staff, I said, we need to identify what are bananas and what are real things. Like, why are, is there certain things that we do because like Maureen Passerini 25 years ago got hit with a cold water jet. And like, we're still doing it, you know, just because of it. So I can think of how many things that we've changed when we came in. And the first thing I would say is, I asked why. Like, well, that's not the way we do things. Why? Like, was it because there's a real reason behind that? Or is it because some monkey 20 years ago got hit with a water jet 
and we're still doing it because nobody's had the uh, nerve to ask the question why. So I went through the first, I'm still doing it, I think every day, I think Dan just yesterday had a conversation and says, well, that's not the way we do things, Rob, and I went, why? Like, is it, a, is it a banana? And I actually, right, Sharon, use that term all the time, is it a banana? And that's it, we, we, uh, we start with every conversation with, is it a banana? So I would honestly say the same thing with what you do in your offices for the managers and what we do as agents every day. Do we do it because that's what we were taught in the 1990s or is it because it's the right thing to do now? So I, I love the approach because you, know, you have changed a lot. And I remember one of the first things that you did when you came in um, is you said, we're never bringing an agent backwards on split. And that was, one of the, that was a banana. And for years as a manager, it was kind of like awkward. You'd have you know, an agent that would have a down year and then it was like, just based on our model, we gotta bring that person back split wise. And Rob came in and the first thing he said, and that's, that's something that you, know, you could look at and say, does it cost the company money? Maybe, yeah. but a lot. a lot of money, but not maybe, <laughs> it definitely cost the company money. No. But, but the reality is, is like, it's the right thing to do. Can I say, it doesn't cost us money, it saves us. And, I, and I'd love to say, take credit for that. If it's Tracy here, she'll be here at some point. And I would say it, it was a combination of myself and Tracy, really, and, and I throw Dan in there as well. The second Hal retired, we had an opportunity to start making changes that we knew we needed to make as a company. And uh, Hal, Hal, for all of his, he was great at what he did. And he was, you know, I would never say ill will about the gentleman, he was great. But, you know, maintain, he maintained the course very well for what it was. and. You know, he would, he, he would take some prodding for us to get changes, to, for us to adapt to the bananas in the room would take some prodding. So the second that opened up, there was a lot of us that wanted to try new things. So when he, I think Sue Yannicone came in and Dan became the broker of record. Um, Sue didn't have a broker's license, so Dan became the broker of record. And um, we immediately went to Sue, like, we gotta change this. And we just started piling changes on that we'd been sitting on for, for years of want. It, I don't know if it cost us money because ultimately I think it, Agents are happier, and I think happier agents do better, and agents that are motivated do better. Agents weren't leaving us because of an awkward conversation with the manager. I think we moved. I mean, is there anybody here? I'm, I'm going to open up. This is the only time I'll... Anybody here on a 50-50 split? <laughs> we had to shift. I mean, our split scales were 50-50 splits. Our, you know, we had people on 47s. We had people that were just not, you know, responsive. I wonder what would have happened in, like... What would have happened? Because my competition from 2003 is in the back of the room. I can't share secrets. <laughs> She kicked my butt back in Montclair back in the day, and I'll, I'll always give her credit for that. The, um, um, we had to, we had to move, we had to move our, with the, what would have happened when Keller Williams came back in in 2009, when they came in with everybody got 70-30 and you paid a bill, like, well, we're sitting here saying no, 50-50. They would never have had upstart had we been more competitive with things, you know, we can serve the agents better, we can serve the consumer better. There's always somebody who will do it for cheaper. So what would have happened if we had actually been progressive then? I, I think we got ahead of it. So we're no longer chasing the curve. But with that, you see those things that you guys see in our office, right? And sometimes it's a frustration. You see like, well, the managers are bringing on a lot more agents. Well, do the math on it. When you're getting smaller pieces of the pie, you need more pie. You know, and, and it has that. You're gonna see uh, a lot of other changes as they go react to that. Unfortunately, the negative that came, Michael, from that of the split changes is as agents take a larger piece, the, the, the interest in then reducing what you charge the consumer occurs. Because uh, you're, not, you're not bad math people. You realize I've had 50, 50, $10,000, I made 5,000, but now I'm on a 90, so I'm, like, I'm making up numbers, by the way. Okay. But now I'm on a 90, I can charge one and a half and still make my 5,000. And so the inclination is that like, oh, I can charge the consumer less because I'm getting a bigger piece. And you're doing the math from where you shouldn't do the math. You should do the math from the high end of what you can potentially make, not from, let's compare it to what I would have made if I was on a 50, 50. And I think that what happened you know, automatically when the split started to migrate north and we stopped roots. And by the way, why did I stop rolling them back? I, I call it the Dusty Smith. If anybody remembers Dusty Smith in Marstown? I love Dusty. She passed away a few years ago, but she'd been with the company for 30 something years. I'm like, what are we gonna do? Like, we're gonna have these agents who've been with us for 30 years, get to their peak, their top 10 in the company, and then all of a sudden they, they, they I don't know, they turn 75 and their sphere gets smaller because they all moved to Florida. They're still great agents, but they gotten less business and now I'm gonna roll her back? For two reasons. One, no, she's, you ought to respect her for all the years and services she's given to the company and loyalty. And, and two, her name means more. Her name with us is relevant in our office, even though her production may have dropped. Gosh, if she went to, I call it Weicker, I'll make up, an, I'll just say names. I have no major threats of competition. So if you hear me say company names, it's not like I'm picking on somebody. But if she went to Weicker, they got Dusty Smith. I mean, they may have gotten, you know, senior Dusty Smith, who only sells one house a year at this point, but she's still a legend and somebody worthy of respect. So I think out of respect for the agents, we did it, and also for the fact of competitive in the market. All right, so we're getting a little bit more loaded here. We 
we've seen a lot of changes that have gone on, not only in our industry, but specifically with Anywhere. I mean, we've switched over, obviously, from Realogy. Um, you know, within Cobol Banker, you know, obviously Ryan Gorman more recently. Um, I'm curious from your perspective, and I, and I know this, and I'm, I think everybody else would be, be, it's insightful, is Ryan Snyder has a vision. Yeah. And he has a, a very specific vision on where real estate is going and where we as a company need to go. And I believe you are very much in line with that vision. So speak to it. Hold on. Yes, I'm in line. Uh, by the way, I, I was gonna, Michael had me, I know. You, you heard that, right? Now, now I'll make a lot of noise while I say the second half. Um, no, I will say this. In fact, Michael wanted me to go third today and I said, no, I want to go first just in case. Um, <laughs> So, um, should change it fast. No, um, I, I'm in line. Actually, he came in, and I forgot where it was that we first met him, and I'm looking at my manager group. It may have been this room when he first came in, and he had that meeting with us, and he said, like, you guys have the hardest job in the world. I don't know how you're doing it, because we were number one real estate company in the world, and we, and we weren't necessarily selling the best product. Like, what we were offering the agent was great. We had awesome managers. We had tons of locations. We had tons of stuff. But it was expensive, right? The agents were giving us 50%. And what we were doing was we were taking 50% of, think, think of the math this way, and this is something that, it's a shift in the mindset of the agent, because it, it, it isn't profit, it isn't company dollars. Now, we were taking your money, and then putting it in a pool, and then spending it back on you. And it was like, well, we had planned ads. You remember those, like New York Times? Well, we had three ads this. You know, yeah, you remember those, I'm glad they're gone. The, um, but we had planned this, and then we had all these different things that we gave back. You got postcards with everything, but we gave you back things that either you saw value in or you didn't see value in. But the idea was we pulled all the money. Now, we don't pull as much money. We talked about that. Some agent splits have migrated north, and we retain less. And so what we've had to do then is figure out with the smaller amount that we've retained back and pulled together, how do we use that to still make sure that the consumer gets the best product out there, right? We don't, I, I'll never go the root of a company that just basically says, hey, we'll take X amount of dollars a month and do whatever the hell you want for the consumer. Because I think at the end of the day, the consumer is going to make the decision at the table who they use, and it should be somebody who can actually serve them. So us arming you with the ability to provide a value to the consumer should win at every time, as long as you guys are able to convey that, which is why we push listing concierge so much. I promise you I do not make a dollar on listing concierge. Every time you use listing concierge, I spend money, physically write a check. Um, depending on what level, it's like $800 or $1,000 if you use platinum, and it's down to a couple hundred bucks if you use silver or bronze or whatever the other category is out. It's like 50 bucks for me. Take my money. The reason we're doing that is we know you'll beat that consumer who's at the listing table with the consumer who's basically saying, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to just charge 2%, and it's better than what Cobalt Banker's off charging you. So, like, you know, it's to beat that. But so he does have this vision. He sat in here and he said, um, you know, we have all of this, but it, we were selling something that was harder. So his vision is um, giving to the consumer, getting closer to the transaction, brokers reward the agents more, and then tie in those bundled services that the consumer wants. We know the consumer wants ease of use. They want that advisor to walk them through the mortgage, the title, the handling of the transaction. And I can tell a story in a second about that if you want. And he sees this vision of tightening it up. He doesn't see a vision of us having a thousand offices. As you see around the country, you'll see a condensing of the number of offices because he believes in condensing talent. You know, and I say this nicely with all my awesome managers in the room. There's 46 awesome managers here in New Jersey. If you told me I needed to hire 80 and grow to 80 offices, I don't know where the hell I would find 40 more awesome managers. Because people, and I'll look at you as I, as I say this, never, never going to happen, right? <laughs> would be an awesome manager. But the fact is, a lot of people go into this, and people who'd be great managers become great team leaders. And they use that same skill set to coach teams and to develop agents and to drive productivity for themselves rather than driving it for a company. So the, um, the, the pool of people who love what we do, I would almost say like we're the teachers. The managers are the people who choose to teach. You know your students are going to go on to Harvard and you know, great schools and do great things in life while you're just going to teach the next generation of people. That's sort of what managers do. They, they're the teachers in the world. They, they want to groom amazing agents and then have them go. So he does. He believes in consolidation. He doesn't think that we're going to win the battle because we have the largest army. He's going to think we have it because we have the best. We're going to have the best because, one, we, we compensate fairly. He's not going to say overly because otherwise we retain less, which means we have less to offset and to offer back to you in forms of you know, consolidating for the consumer. So he does have a very clear vision about that. So a little bit more loaded, and I should follow up to what you just said. <laughs> um, we talk about consolidation. Like, I think that that's, from an agent perspective, that's something that agents tend to fear. 
What does that look like from your perspective? Uh, by the way, I'll introduce myself. I'm the president of Philadelphia. I, I mean, I don't know if anybody knows, I'm now the president of Philadelphia and, and, and New York. Um, like that, that's consolidation. That's what it looks like. You know, there was a president of Philadelphia in central Pennsylvania, and now it's me. Like it does, did, did Philadelphia lose their president, or can it be looked at as they gained me? Like, you know, you don't know. I think David was a, a great leader, but that's what consolidation can feel like. Um, we have amazing managers. As we consolidate in, I look at it as you're consolidating talent. I went out to Philadelphia to meet the agents for the first time in the offices that I'm now see, overseeing, and I came back raving. And I think the managers in my regionals heard me say this. They were like, they had four awesome managers. And they were awesome. And they were delivering manager meetings in the, to their office, to their, their uh, agents. And I was like, wow, I don't know how many of my managers could deliver this meeting. It was like life changing. And I found out later she was like a trainer, educator, like that's what she does for a living. <laughs> but I'm like, she was doing atomic habits, book reviews, getting people up. Jen, I'm like, they're, you guys are like things. And I'm like, you guys are awesome. And then I, I called up and I was talking to Dan on my ride home. And I was like, wow. And I said, you know, how does that, you know, I, I go, but of course she's got good managers because she only needed to find four. Like, you know, we have to find 46. Like, it, you know, talent gets consolidated. I look at mortgage and title and I see you guys hiding over here, or mortgage at least, over here. We had these meetings and we're like, okay, well, we have, we have mortgage reps in this company and like, if we have 30 mortgage reps overseeing 40, we have to have 40 good ones. You know, like if a consolidated means that more people get laning, more people, you know, get the uh, mortgage reps that you have. So everything that's consolidated means a tighter, you get better talent and more access to it. So for me, consolidation shouldn't feel like loss of what you have. It should look at it as the gain of what you're getting, which is uh, a consolidation of talent. So every person in here um, fights a constant battle. I mean, we have the competition, obviously. We have limited inventory. And one of the battles is why Coldwell Banker? So, you know, obviously every person in here should be you know, able to speak to their own value proposition, but you lead our company and our company's changed. It's, it's evolved over the years. Um, it's not necessarily what it once was. In, in many ways, it's better. So I'm curious from your perspective, why are you proud to be with Coldwell Banker and why do you feel we should win at the listing table? I'm going to break that in, in half. Uh, it's interesting because just like you guys all probably get calls from a lot of companies, managers get calls from a lot of companies, I get calls from lots of companies and people out there. Um, I always think about at the end of the day, when I introduce myself to somebody from the public or somebody in my family and I tell them what I do, the day, you know, and, I, and I'm proud to say where I work. I'm proud of the company where I work. I feel it's professional. I feel like the reputation is solid. I feel like you're not, you're not, it's not sales. It's not, it's, it's advisor. It's something great about being a part of a company that has like integrity and morals when it comes to this. Uh, there's some companies out there that I wouldn't put my name on. I think I, at one point when I was a manager, I told the vice president, like, you can call me in my last five years. So I was like, when I'm getting ready to retire, fine, I'll come over there. You can give me tons of money before I retire and I'll just sell my soul for the money. Like, I just couldn't do it. I just can't put my name on something like that. So as far as me personally with this, it's just, if, if you know that every single conversation that goes on in the back room over there is about the agents and about the consumer, it might not always feel it because we're looking at it through our own lenses and our personal lenses, but it, it, it's about the agents and it's about the consumer. I would even say it's probably about the agents first, and my push is always it should be about the consumer because by serving the consumer, we're serving the agents. Right? Like, your job should be easier if we do better for the consumer. If we're the best place for the consumer to transact a transaction, and like our agents will win every transaction. Now, as far as the, what would I say uh, as a, from an agent point of view for affiliate? Every manager kind of has their own um, value, but what I say as far as an agent goes, is it's the number four. And if, we, if remember a long time ago, we had a listing presentation. I'm trying to figure out who was here back when we had the book, and it was like one, two, three, four. And it was like a listing book you would get. And it was like number one was what all realtors in the world offer. And the number, Jerry, I just saw you just had the recollection, now he knows it. Number two was like what we as a company offered. Number three step was like what your office offered, different. And number four was what you as an individual agent offer. And I think if I would say anything right now that has shifted more than anything before, in the past it was okay to go with what the number three was. Like one and two was pretty standard, but number three, your office was pretty good. And if you think by Marstown people, we had these things that we did, or Montclair people, we did things that at office level, but so did everybody else in your office. The number four is probably the most important. It's what differentiates you from the person sitting next to you. You're all part of the same office. You're all part of the same company. You're all part of the same real estate industry. What is it that you differentiate yourself with? And I think if you look at the tools and resources, and I know I'm putting a big commercial out there for Revitalize, but I'll say the same thing for how you utilize your relationship with the mortgage company or how you utilize your relationship with the title company, um, how you utilize um, some of the other products. It's 
how do you adapt what we offer as a company to being a personal offer for yourself and uh, to what can best be the consumer? So I would focus the majority of your time saying, what's my four? Like, what's my number four? And if you can figure out, and honestly, you don't know what your number four is, reach out to your manager, they'll tell you what your four is. We all know what each other's strengths are. Talk to fellow agents in your office, sit in a room together, and help each other figure out what your number four is. And I think if you figure out what your four is, and then you can look at what three is and say, how do I utilize the tools and resources so that you don't have to pay and reinvent you know, the way to deliver what your four is, I think you can probably really advance that and go through the industry and everything else. So I would say, honestly, uh, how to win, Use the things that we offer, the tools, the resources, the desk. Go to, even if you go to some of these things just to learn what we offer, because I hate the fact that like, I, God, I, we sat in that meeting a couple weeks ago and I learned every day more things we have that Revitalize even can do. And I'm like, they can do what? They do moving and they do storage? I didn't know they did storage. So I'm over here going, you could walk into a house and say, you're a cluttered house for 100 years. I'm going to list your house. I'm going to have a service come in and declutter it, store it, clean it, paint it refer your stuff, sign your floors up before you hit the market while it's all exclusively listed during that time and, and get it all done and you don't have to pay till the closing table. Like that's a nice way to position a number four with using number three, you know, to pay the bills for you and something you couldn't do on your own. But a lot of people don't present it in that manner. Can I ask a question? Yes. I would love to be able to go in and present and revitalize like that, but I was told that's kind of you can. They're going to talk more about it in a second, but yes. By the way, everybody interrupt me. I do better when I like questions come up because it puts me back online. Uh, you can. That was a banana. So a perfect example to tie these stories together. We, I came in here and it was called an inducement. Well, we couldn't present it. You couldn't wait till after you listed the house until, remember that? Yes. If you all learned? That was such a banana. I walked in and I went right to the attorneys and I'm like, why are we doing this? Well, because that's the way we do it. I'm like, no, that's the way the previous administration wanted to do it because they were less risk adverse. Probably because he was the broker. I have Dan's broker's license there, it's not mine. So I'm a little bit more loose. So I'm like, and, so Dan and I have a great agreement. Dan's agreement with me is, we we're gonna change it. By the way, I am a broker. Uh, they were gonna move the broker's license back and Roseanne, who may or may not be in the room, was at the dinner table and they were announcing me as president. It was, we were at Sue's house, it was just the regionals. And um, they were like, Roseanne goes, oh no, I gotta do the paperwork to move the broker's license over to Rob. And Dan goes, well, do we have to do it so fast? And then I called them later and I was like, tell me why it matters. Like, what is it? And he kind of shared with me some insight. Dan loves that. He has a passion for being that role. And so I, I don't. I love the forward thinking. I love that. I don't care. I don't want to get involved in the arbitrations at the board level and the angry consumer. So my conversation with Dan was, oh, absolutely. You're the broker of record. Two things. One, because the Real Estate Commission guidelines state the broker of record is the end all be all decision maker in all things real estate, right? Accountability falls on the broker, not the president. So I said, as long as you always agree with me, we're cool. <laughs> number two, number two was I never want to hear from an angry homeowner. So I never want to hear from an angry. If you, you can't, the man, if the agent can't solve it, and the manager can't solve it, and it gets to the regional, and the regional can't solve it, and they call me, mm -mm. I'm going to be like, that sounds like a broker issue. You need to talk to the broker. So that was the, uh, but that was it. But it was the banana, and he was very. Uh, and Dan and I both are risk are not risk adverse. Like we're we're willing to take the like. You don't know where the line in the sand is until you cross it. It's like. Don't do that. Like as a kid, like trust me, my son's already figured this out. He's five. It's like he goes here. I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna not gonna yell just yet. All right. So the line really wasn't there. And you keep moving. You don't know where the line is until you face the repercussions for having crossed the line. We haven't found it yet. So I pushed it now to saying that you know we can present it at the time of listing. So you can present this. Present away. I had I had spoken to the attorneys and the people to reduce the risk, saying by the time you're on that listing appointment, you have a business relationship already with that agent, that consumer. They've called you in. You're presenting a listing. You're presenting, like, I'm going to do these five steps of advertising. How's that not an inducement? I'm going to do an open house every weekend. How's that not an inducement? You're telling them what their home is worth. How is that not a business relationship when you're giving advice on what the home is worth? So the idea being that we're not already in a business relationship at that point, but somehow, like, I don't know who drew the line or who got hit with a water jet, uh, you know, and said we can't do it. We can. So present away what we can't do. And by the way, I'm willing to allow you, with Dan's broker's license, to, <laughs> for the record, to push the line until we find the line. And the idea behind the line is you can, people say, can I do a video talking about all the great things that Revitalize offers? Yes, you can. Can you put at the end of the video to find out how we can do this for you or to list your house with me? Call, no, that's when it becomes an inducement. If you do this, I'll do that. That becomes the inducement. But can you do a video? Like I'm gonna film one. I'm about to put my uh, wife owns a place in North Brunswick, about to put it on the market. And um, I said already, like I'm gonna go in day one. It's been rented for 13 years. It, it is a mess, as you could imagine. Um, I'm going to go in day one, I'm going to film the whole thing and I'm going to let her 
film it from the day we walk in and see the condition of the place to the day that it hits the market and all the different things that Revitalize can do. I don't know if you even know that I'm doing this. And, uh, okay. And I'm going to put that out there for the world to see because what I'm not going to put at the end of that video is to, to find out how we can do it for you. Call us to list your house. That's where it becomes the inducement. So just be careful on how you present your skills. So could we put a, like a real vitalized tile on our own personal websites? Could we link to the realvitalized.com? Uh, I'm getting a nod yes over there. Just to be clear, real vitalized is, is definitely, Nicole's going to speak all about real vitalized. You're going to have so a lot of, deep dive on that I'll defer on a lot of that. I would love for you all to be very creative with that. Because, and there's some reasons that I think, if we, as I'm waiting for Michael to probably prompt into a different line of questioning at some point. But uh, when we get to that, I'll, I'll share some ideas. Share, share with me what that line of question is. Say, I figured you were better prepared for this. I don't know. Did you just say contact me to find out more? Yes. That's kind of vague, but right. Yes. That's, that's, um, uh, that's I mean, vague. The only thing I would say more about Real Vitalize is I think it's a, it's a, you know, somebody came up with a cute, clever name, but Compass Concierge is a much better uh, name. And I recently lost a listing to somebody who flat out said to me, you know, oh, well, Compass Concierge take care of everything. I said, well, uh, we talked about this. And I mean, shame on me. I guess I, I, did, I definitely didn't do a good enough job explaining it. But for now on, I'm calling the Global Banker Concierge. Cool. That, you I can. Mean, I, feel like I was going to say shame on you. <laughs> Only because I like you and you know how much I respect you. I had this phone call the other day. We had this conversation. I know. I was going to say, I would have said shame on you only because she's so good at what she does and she's fantastic. So I feel like I know her well enough to be able to say that. Like a lot of times, like we'll lose some battles. And again, it's like when you list, you on a listing appointment with your best friend or a family member or something and you end up, they don't list with you because you just assumed you were going to get it and you presented things very surface level and somebody else went in full on and gave them the full presentation. Like sometimes I think we think we're like, even me, I just stated the same thing now 10 times in a row because I don't know which one is going to resonate. I would always say like, you know, what we think sometimes is, is resonating. Maybe try to make sure you go full in and explain it. Uh, line of, uh, I forgot already, Michael. Just keep going. I'll get with where. We were on a call the other day, and I thought this was really interesting. And I'd love, I think it kind of leads into a, another line of thinking in terms of the future. So, the conversation that came up on this call was along the lines of, and you brought up uh, Compass, so I'm just going to throw that out there as a competitor. Um, there's a million competitors, we all know that. And what I found interesting is from a corporate perspective, that's not what they view as the competition and mm -hmm. at all. Like that's not, it, it wasn't even, it was brought up in conversation and we as agents and managers and, and brokers even, a lot of times think that like, oh, our competition is Keller or our competition is Weikert or whoever, fill in the blank, you know, local players in our marketplace. And that's not how they looked at the world. And I'm just curious, like, what your opinions are on that. And Bruce, Bruce Ziff said that long ago, and he always, and he used to come in and say, like, our competition doesn't exist. The thing that's our competition doesn't exist. Like, you know, gosh, Compass had great, you know, abilities out west, and they came to New Jersey, and I think in the first year we took more people from them than they, you know, recruited from us. Uh, it didn't happen here because, as I said, we have the best agents and the smartest agents, and you're savvy. You don't fall for. BS, like give me something solid, give me something tangible and real. Otherwise, you know, you don't, you're not going to fall for a bunch of words. So, uh, you know, that New Jersey tough, you know, attitude, you know, proved to be exactly right. So the, the conversation of what's the real disruptor is going to be ultimately somebody tinkering in their garage, right? I don't think it's Redfin. I don't think it was Fox Inns. It wasn't Purple Bricks. Remember, they were coming in. Uh, it doesn't exist. There's a million people out there. There's a disruptor somewhere that we should be wor worried about. They probably aren't funded yet. They're probably just some college kids tinkering around in a garage. You know, still, that's going to come up with an idea that's going to put us on our heels. And that's the stuff that we worry more about is like, where do we go from that? You know, just making sure that, you know, we're prepared for the competition that doesn't exist. Because what is everything else? Like, oh, I'll use Compass. They came in. They had a model, maybe? They were a technology company or something that they said. Now they're trying to figure out how to become a conventional real estate company. They say every time a competitor comes into the business, they're like, let's say we're just brokerage and we're awesome. And then these people over here are the disruptors. Over time, disruptors have to get more and more to conventional brokerage because they have to eventually learn how to sell houses, make money, and become a profitable company. Um, and then we steal the technology and some of the ideas that the disruptors have come up with. So we move closer to being a disruptor, and the, and the gap closes. So uh, I don't think that right now anything exists that we can't replicate or that we can't R&D. You know, something that, you know, like you said, Compass Concierge comes in, boom, revitalized, maybe a horrible name. But like, same thing, but like, and can we do it? Great, we wouldn't have had that had they not have thought of an idea of providing a service like that to the consumer. So we do take that technology if it's allowable and legal, and we can usually shift quicker on it. Uh, what was the last year? Uh, 
where we were buying the homes, iBuyer programs and things like that. They came in, we offered it, they failed, we closed ours down, but we gave it a shot. Like, you know, we're not, we're not so, you know, dead set on things. You had a question? So, uh, just on a related thing, I don't know if it's purely local or if it's broader, what do you think about the whole list for 1% that we're seeing more and more of? Again, uh, I, I think of Don Ricard, one of my favorite managers in the world, and, uh, a guy that you know, never sat in the back of the room with me because he was always up front being really good. Um, but it, it, you, there was always, the comment was always, there's always somebody out there who'll do it for less. Right? I, I guarantee you if I go out in that parking lot out there, there are some fancy cars. You know, there's other cars that are cheaper. You know, I'm looking at shoes in the room. There's people who make cheaper shoes. You know, at some point the consumer's gonna draw the, uh, the uh, line of quality. And I think if we go in, thinking that we have to lead with price and not value, you know, I think we do a disservice. And I think when you talk about those 1%, um, if the consumer believes we're all equal, you know, and all things being equal, the price will, you know, dictate. But so I think it's up to us to make sure that we don't leave the consumer thinking all things being equal. You kind of get what you pay for. There's a million different dialogues that you could use for that. Like, oh, I heard somebody go in there once. I forgot who I was with. And the conversation was just like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you brought me in because you thought I was going to be the cheapest. They're like, they're like, why'd you bring me in? Well, everybody tells me you're the best. Anybody tell you I was the cheapest? Like, you're like why? No, okay, well, I'm the best, okay. So you have to tell me, what are you looking for? Do you want the best or do you want the cheapest? And there was a conversation that I think falls on us. Uh, do I fear that we're gonna get there? Yeah, that's why I started the conversation by saying that as we progress splits up, my fear was that the agents were going to automatically progress consumer fees lower because they're gonna look at it from the bottom dollar as opposed to the potential top dollar. And I'd rather see that because as you charge them less, the percent the company sees is less, which means I can then offer less in return. And I love the fact that we're consolidating and making great business decisions because they're the best business decisions for the company. I would hate to see us have to make business decisions because we run out of resources to make and execute good decisions. Right, so that's why I, I still push like there, yeah, there's a fear, especially out in your market. You know, you're seeing it a lot. Hope, I'm here. By the way, guys, if I ever leave, follow. Like, uh, I always say, like, I'm here. I got a five-year-old. I got an eight-year-old. Like, I got to pay for college in 10 years. I mean, go Bernie. Like, I don't know. At some point, I have to raise this money. The, um, I, need, I need to be somewhere where it's going to be viable. I believe we're the most viable, best real estate company in the world. And if a better model is out there, I'll, I'll find it. I'll either develop it and build it here or, like, you know, follow me out the door because there's something better. So, yeah, I do believe that that model will succeed. I don't think there's a disruptor. I think when you look at disruptors companies like YHDs and Purple Bricks and some of these flat fees, there's a reason they failed to launch. You know, and it's because ultimately the consumer has a large investment. It's their, probably their best, biggest asset. And if, I'm telling you, I got a stock portfolio. And if, I'm, if the guy comes up to me and says, hey, your broker's doing great for you, but I'll charge less. Why are you charging less? Like, I don't know. Like, I had a guy come to my house who does projectors because my projector blew at my house. And I'm paying more because I trust this dude. <clears throat> because I don't want my next one to blow. So there, I mean, I, might, I think I'm like a regular person in the sense where I'll pay more if I know it's good. And so I don't, so while I think there's enough consumers out there who, and I'll give you the story, this is a story. I bought a Tesla, I'm like an early adopter. So like five years ago, I bought a Tesla. I've never bought a car online before. I don't know if any of you have ever bought a car online. It's weird, especially an expensive car online. And I didn't know what to do. And I'm like pushing buttons. They're like, place your order? I'm like, it's a lot of money. Like to just place an order. And I've never bought a car. How do I know I did this right? So I went to the Short Hills Mall where they have a thing. When I walked in, I swear to you, there was like a 12-year-old kid behind the counter. I mean, he was 12. Either I got older or he got younger. Uh, or they're hiring young kids, you got working papers. Uh, and I didn't want to buy the car, so I'm like, I just wanted to do it in person. They have a kiosk on the wall, and you can like order the car. And like, I'm getting guided through the process by a 12-year-old kid. I'm like, this kid does not even know how to drive. His mom dropped him off. There's no doubt. <laughs> but yet, I felt better about this purchase because I did it next to somebody who actually had done it before. And I think that's where you talk about trusted advisors, and I think that's where we talk about the value of the consumer. I don't think we have to justify our fee between 1% and 2% on the listing side, or 1% or 2.5% or 3% on the listing side. I think what we have to uh, justify to them is the comfort in knowing that you have an advisor who's done this before, who does this monthly, weekly, daily, lives that life and can guide you through it, has the support of managers and regionals and a corporate in the background who has integrity. And I think that that matters that we're in one of the world's most integral and, and highest integrity companies. I think it matters. And I think at the end of the day, when you've got a large asset like that, you know, it, it's going to matter. So I still don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're ready to, like, why are these buying processes? Like, you, why can't you just go on Zillow and make an offer on a house? Because at the end of the day, you still want you. The consumer still isn't going to pull the trigger. Like, I wasn't going to pull the trigger on a car. I don't think the consumer is going to pull the trigger 
without one of you in the room, as long as we convey that still and we can still provide that value. So this actually leads me to a question, um, and I'm going to preface it with a quick story. Um, so obviously, you know, we recruit from all different companies, and one company that I've been recruiting from a lot lately is EXP. And what, and I'm not picking on EXP, it's not about that, but one thing that I've heard from a lot of EXP agents um, through the years is we're entrepreneurial. And, and Coldwell Banker, you guys are dinosaurs, so to speak, in, in different language, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but I've heard like along those lines. And so recently, one of the, the uh, most productive EXP agents in the state um, came over to us. And when she joined me, like, you know, that was part of the conversation is like understanding, like, you know, how we push the limits of, of real estate and, and business. And she did eventually join and she came in and she did something that was pretty funny is she she essentially tried to start her own referral company like within our, you know, with online and she was pushing stuff out to, to agents and immediately got her hand slapped. Uh, but here's the, I loved it. here's the interesting thing. So the reason why I tell this story is I actually, I, I didn't know what she was doing. She pushed it out to me and I hadn't read it in time and, and the powers that be read it before I did. And, and they shut it down because it was done through like an internal site. And what I found interesting is I got a phone call from Rob and Rob was laughing about it. And he was like, I got to give her credit. It was pretty smart what she put together. And he goes, and I'm not shutting down her Facebook version of this. I'll only shut down the, the internal one because quite honestly, like from an internal perspective, we just can't push that out. It's a conflict of interest. But online, like she could do that. And I'm, I'm okay with like her, you know, uh, building that relationship. And I got to go back to that agent and say, listen, I'm not condoning this by any means, but I want you to know that the president of our company actually like commended you for being creative. Like, and, and she, she, she actually executed it better than our internal company <laughs> did. Like she literally put out a message that was really good. It was like, hey, I'm setting up a new leads uh, referral network for New Jersey. So anybody come to New Jersey, I'll make sure I put it in touch with the right person in the right location. I'm, I'm like, that was, it was beautiful. Like we have this iLeads team and they're out there, you know, with relocation going back and forth. I'm like, good luck finding the tab on the desktop somewhere. She had this whole thing branded out, looked good. I'm like, I would call her if I knew the thing. So, I, so clearly I had to shut that down. It was better than what we had. No, I love the fact that she did it. But if you think it was, by the way, it wasn't me. Um, if you think about it, she took, she made her number four out of something that was a number three. Like she did exactly that. She utilized one of our internal systems to do it. Like entrepreneurial uh, so, agents, you guys are entrepreneurial. I, I look at it all the time. Call the bank is not here to stop that. It's actually here to help it. If I want to open a sandwich shop and you know, I can go out and open a Rob sandwich shop and put it in the thing and buy my own meats and cheeses and you know, set up and make sandwiches. Or I can be entrepreneurial. I can contact you know, Subway or something else and really set up my own business and operate my own business through that. I mean, how long of a line is it to get a Chick-fil-A to own, you know, right now? Like, I can make chicken sandwiches anywhere, but I'd rather own a company that has a reputation that's gonna afford me, you know, name rec recognition and credibility. I think that's what I push for in the company, is I don't push, I, I was gonna point my vest, I'm looking at Joe's little CD, Ryan Gorman vest. The, um, I don't push the brand. The brand is the credibility. That's the thing that's gonna allow you, the consumer to go in and go in like, they got a solid company, I don't know you, but I know your company, so you might be good but like I'll find out. And so I, we, you're the entrepreneur still and what you do with it is the most important thing. And I want you all to do it in your own ways. I'd love to see online stuff being all over the way in different ways because you can all steal from each other and do things as different ways. So I'm not, certainly the company doesn't want to, to stifle entrepreneurship. In fact, we would love to give you the resources that allow you to do it. And that's what I would think if you could take anything from that. Is so I'm, I'm glad you, you're, you're leading me into where I'm going with this and that's, what I found in my role that I was most impressed with is how creative we are in terms of pilots around the country. And what we do, because a lot of times we'll hear questions and the questions that'll come up is, why are we not buying leads? Or why are we not you know, doing yeah. what X, Y, and Z company is doing? And it, it's interesting to me is we are. And I, I would love for you to speak to, because I think that and without going into examples of pilots, because some of it is confidential, I understand that. but. What I'd love for you to speak to is kind of the, the process that Coldwell Banker takes, because I don't think agents tend to understand that or know it, because it's behind the scenes. First, let me talk about buying leads. Uh, 20 years ago, Zillow, 18 years ago, Zillow comes out, hey, give us all your listings and we'll provide you all your leads. Fab Plus, Fab Four, Fab 18. We give them all the leads, they get all the stuff, we give them the listings that allows them to 
spend their money not on generating a business model, but rather presenting their website to the consumer, giving our leads, and our leads are coming back to us for a very small fee that the company picked up on your behalf. Uh, most of it, I think there was a small agent charge. And then pretty soon it became now, you know, then you paid for leads and they shut off that and you had to buy zip codes and you, they paid for all of that. And so you started to pay small fees for the leads coming back and there was no brokerage deal with the brokerage companies anymore. And now it's 35% flex and it's 35% fees on every single one of those listings for that they gained because we opened the door and we started the process of allowing them to take our listings and do that. So buying leads, yeah, we could, and there have been pilot programs out there. I still think that's the worst thing in the world. We have what they don't have, which is people with relationships. You know, inside of six degrees of separation, you have you know, relationships with these people. You should be able to meet these people before they ever go on Zillow. Or they go on Zillow, look at a house, then call you before they click on request more information on the website if we do our jobs well. But the point is, certainly these programs where you see us not doing them anymore is because we've been burned once, and if we get burned again, it's shame on us. You know, like we entered that relationship with Zillow very much thinking that that was going to be positive across the board, and all companies did. And now what they did, they bought showing time. So we weren't going to give them the information. Remember last, a year ago, it was rentals. They wanted to have all the rental information, $99 a week or whatever it was going to be. And they were going to have access to all the rent, the tenant information and your landlord information. Uh, we all, I said no. And that's, that was one of the first things I did. And thank you all for not revolting and picketing my door. But I said no, as a company, I'm not going to pay that because I would rather not. I, in fact, created a marketing campaign that some offices used that said basically looking for homes on Zillow, just understand they're all not there. The only place you're going to find them all is my website because I have everything, including the rentals and the exclusives, and Zillow doesn't. Like, let's start to hit them where it hurts. Let's start to get the consumer to realize that they only have what we give them, not everything. And they quickly backed off of that and they pulled that. But what did they do? They bought showing time. Like, guess what? Now they got all your info. So they're saying they're not going to use it for nefarious reasons, but no, like, they, they lied once before. Like what's to make us think that somehow that showing time's not? So honestly, right now we're in, we, we can't change that. You guys use it and it's like a 100% adopted tool. Um, do, is there a lot of money being invested in pilots and things to try to avoid having to use showing time because of what the relationship has been in the past? Yes. So I do think somewhere down the road that that is a possibility. Um, but that's something, let me just give you two things on the pilot programs. Uh, we, we're aggressive. Michael and I had piloted a program here um, in New Jersey which was it was okay. Right now, there's a pilot program somewhere going off. It was, we had so many hand custom restrictions on us, it was actually hard to make it succeed. But they were willing to. Like, we got learnings from it. We learned some things about agent behavior and some you know, people's behaviors, which I think has come in handy for the other things. So we have this thing. It's, like, it's not success and failure. It's like success and learning. Right? You don't fail. You learn. And you learn what worked and what didn't work, and you try to move from there. There's pilot. You guys should all be thrilled. There's pilot programs that have floor plans on listing concierge around the country. So they are being tested. They're in different markets, not here, because we have, we have 20,000 listings. Like for us to beta test something that's listing driven here has a higher possibility of failing than beta testing it in St. Louis where they might have 300 listings. You know, it's easier for them to understand what works and what doesn't work and work the kinks out there. So we do, we beta test a lot of programs like that. Uh, Pennsylvania had a thing, they called it Project Bananas, so another Bananas reference. <laughs> and uh, it was geared towards uh, driving mortgage and title. And it was rather like, can you over reward, reward and overcompensate agents on the transactions and drive the revenue strictly from mortgage and title? Thinking like, listen, if I gave you everything and even more, all you had to do was use you know, the mortgage and title team over here. you know. You would think that'd be awesome, right? Like, you guys are agents. Like, that's a sweet deal. Like, I, I, you get extra percentage. Yeah, it didn't work. It's not working. I, thank God it's not in the park. But you would think, like, it, it should be like, hey, I got a great team. And uh, it didn't drive. So there's a lot of uh, aggressive plans out there to try to see where we find balance as a company. All right, so I think we're going to pivot to Q&A from, from the audience. Um, I don't know who has questions, but I'd love for you to shout them out. Go ahead. Um, I've been doing this a long time, and I'm very I don't understand why the brokerages are allowing the MLSs to, I think it may be a legal thing, but to be on me, but I've got friends across the country in big brokerages where they are not legal. So I'll give you the, I'll give you one antitrust, but yeah, but as I just got a text message this morning from a competitor going like, is there anything we can do? Oh yeah, I'll repeat the question. The question was like, you know, why are the brokerages playing with Zillow, basically? Why are we allowing them to have our listing? We actually did it. Um, we tried it. You can't, you can't um, collude 
between companies and call each other up and be like, hey, let's all pull our listings off of there and we won't do it. So what happens is this. We did it in St. Louis, I think, was the market where, where as a company, NRT stopped feeding their listings to Zillow. We figured, again, St. Louis, small market, easier to beta. We go in and then the other brokerages would pull back and pull theirs off and eventually that would spawn across. Zillow would have to come to the table and stop being pigs. Like, this isn't going anywhere on the recording, right? You know? <laughs> like they would have to not be pigs. And the idea was that. And instead what happened was what you would expect, those one percenters and those discount brokers went, why would your list with Coldwell Banker? They don't even put your house on Zillow with all the other companies. So the real estate agents cannibalized the programs, progress. They went in there and those agents who don't think about real estate as a career for the future, but rather like one deal at a time, they were, they were willing to throw Coldwell. Now, and the, what we learned from it is the hangover was much worse than the drunk. Here it is, it's like five years later, like we put the listings back on Zillow within a year. They were back on Zillow, but four years later, that company still, or our company still considered the company who doesn't list houses on Zillow. So they're still overcoming the, pre the, the, the misconception of what happens um, because of that. And it wasn't because of a lack of brokerages wanting it, because it'll always be that one person who goes out there and, and does it. So that's, that's unfortunately why, and that was the learnings that came from it. My concern, my thing is, it's the MLSs. I, and I, where, are my, where are my northerners at? Yeah, yeah, you, and Margaret in the back. You know, we have MLSs who don't share our information back to us unless we bend over and like, bow to them, you know, for what it is that they want. We're like, it's my listings. I'm putting it in your MLS. <laughs> you say it. And like, but you won't give me the data back? Or you won't give me a feed? Like, who here is suffering from moxie issues on your website? Right? You're having a hard time with moxie and your things in the MLS feed from New Jersey MLS. Thank God they want to charge me $1,400 a listing or something to get a feed put back over a uh, per agent to f have a feed reconnected to get my own listings back or to get the listings that the broker just put into their website. Like that's the better question as it is like, why do the MLSs feel the ownership of our listings? Because if we as a brokerage were just to say, all right, we'll just start our own thing. Like Garden State does whatever we want. Why? Because we own it, right? It's owned by real estate companies. You know, it's those independent third party MLSs that are still existing out there that are a, a, a root of a lot of problems. Because even if we cut our feed, the MLS would be on certain things. So we don't control our listings. And I think that should have been a NAR thing. So as you work your way through the NAR. The only thing board, I'm gonna add to what you just said is for Zillow, they made a strategic move and they became a brokerage. So now Zillow, if you think about it, unless we, dis, unless we disallow um, IDX for yeah. all of our listings, we can't just single out one brokerage. Um, it's for antitrust reasons, so. I will say that there's some, loss, there's some lawsuits out there right now that I saw and I'm following closely which talk about paper brokerages. And they're, so they're calling it, I love the expression paper brokerages. And what they're talking about with paper brokerages is brokerages that have broker's licenses solely for the purpose of referring business. Right, like, like what you just said was ill. The idea behind it is just to gather up leads and refer it. They're not an honest brokerage. They're not listing and selling houses. They don't have brokers. They don't have supervision. They're only collecting bro uh, referral fees. So the question is, are they in true brokerage? So I think that something could come out of that down the road, maybe listing referral brokerages versus residential brokerages and real brokerages. So I think there's a possibility that the paper brokerages meet a different level of scrutiny that maybe they are conducting real estate or not conducting real estate with proper supervision. So I do think that that's something that could potentially down the road help us you know, as we evolve. Why can't we with Zillow, instead of giving them the whole listing, hold back part of the information like taxes? Because it's IDX, just feed straight through. You can't, you can't, you can't buy it? You can't, what, if you did that for that site, you'd have to do it for all other sites as well. Like, it's just a feed system. And you can't pick and choose what gets fed to what companies. It's just like the, an IBX feed works for, here's all the data, all the data if it passes through. Did you have a question? Yeah, so you're talking paper, oh, I don't know uh, that either. Uh, <laughs> paper brokerages. Nobody needs a mic, I'll send it to you. Uh, paper brokerages like uh, Zillow, yeah. are you talking about the ones that are like, that pay me $500 and I will? No, I think those house. people are actually conducting real estate. Yeah. You know, they're the flat. She's asking, like, this paper, would you consider paper brokerages? First of all, not my term, and I don't want to, like, claim that I'm calling Zillow a paper brokerage. Um, that's for you. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, um, um, no, uh, flat uh, discount service fees, uh, you know, brokerages like that, they're conducting brokerage. They're representing homeowners poorly, they possibly. Have a or, or order in this, in yeah. whatever state? Yeah, they do, and a lot of them do. And, like, like even they. Go to, a, go to an EXP. You can even be inside your own house with a separate entrance, right? Anybody who's taken the broker's exam knows what the rules can be. So there are rules that are in there, and it's more or less, are they, are they representing the consumer or not? And I would say even if you charge a discounted fee to put it in the MLS, you're still representing a consumer. You're, you're actually doing the work. So I, I honestly have to say, 
and I'll say this in a room full of agents, and you guys can find me in the parking lot later and <laughs> tar and feather me. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the hardest thing about running a brokerage is you. It's the liability, it's the lawsuits. I love you all, and I grew up in a real estate house. My mom, my dad, my sisters, my cousins. I, we get used to you know, the interaction and the, and the give and take from the agents and the brokerage aspect of it. These tech companies don't, wouldn't know what the hell to do with one of you when you come in angry, and you're having a bad <laughs> transaction, and the owner's not loving it, and you don't like the deal, and Moxie's listing presentation dropped right at the time of your listing, and you're angry. Like, they wouldn't know how to handle that relationship. Like, they don't want that. You know, so at the end of the day, I don't think a lot of those tech companies are gonna go full on brokerage, because I don't think they wanna manage the people aspect of it. Yeah, so it's kind of that, and, and, and I love that. I love, that's the part I love the most about the business is the people and the interactions and the relationships. I think that's what all of our managers love about this. They wouldn't want to manage a website. The managers, well, managers want to manage people and help you. And I think ultimately that's what differentiates us from those technology companies. Who has a question that's not Zillow related? <laughs> 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 Hold on, Rich. Okay, where do you see the industry five years from now and then 10 years from now? Oh, where do I want to see it or where do I see it? <laughs> um, I, I could tell you some, some fearful examples of where I see it. I hopefully, I don't see it changing much in five years, and here's the reason why. We had a chance to really shift the market when COVID happened three years ago, right? We got to a point where the owners, we were basically saying, go find your house online, drive by the houses, and then call me when you find the one house you want us to open the door to. Like, that was a really close chance that they just decided to call the owner to open that door, not us. Like, why did that not change, right? Because again, I still think they wanted the trusted advisor. They still wanted you there. Because we basically got to a point where we almost took ourselves out of the transaction at that point. And we showed that what we were, were not, we weren't even door openers. We weren't even the people who had to like, drive them to the location. We didn't have to provide the info on the houses. They searched, they found, they drove around in their cars, then they found the house, but they parked out front and was like, this is the one I want to go in. Damn, like we were really close to not having that. So I don't fear us being decentralized from the transaction as far as the agents and the brokerage goes. I don't, I, I feel like they'll always want, for the same reason I bought a car from a 12 year old. I think they're ultimately gonna want somebody with knowledge and I think that as agents, that knowledge you have, uh, you have a team and a growing team and I do think that we, as a brokerage, now here's where my manager group and me might differ, uh, differ in relationships from some team leaders in the sense of I love teams, but we've outsourced a lot of our coaching and training of individual agents to teams. The teams have, you know, you really work your team, I bet, and I know a lot of the other team members do. They have mandatory meetings, and you're there, and you're prospecting, and you're doing these things. And we had to abide by obey ICR regulations, which basically says your independent contractor is not employees, and I can't force you to do anything. So we've sort of outsourced our, you know, prospecting and our lead generations to team leaders, who now you see a rise of teams. And I think ultimately teams will still be related to brokerages for the, big, the bigger reasons. The more business you do, the more liability you face, and the more you know, legal aspects and more targets that are on the team. So I think you'll see a rise of team. My managers know that I've made a big challenge for them earlier this year, and that is to get back into the business of productivity coaching. Like really get your agents back in there and do some of the things that I see the team leaders doing very effectively, which is coaching new business. I love supporting teams and I love the fact that like we have that ability to support, but there's also a part of me as an 18 year old kid out there listing selling houses or something that thinks everybody should have the opportunity to be the next you. You know, and they should have that chance to be a, their own team leader or their own person, like give it a shot. And I want my managers to give everybody the ability to give it a shot, to be as awesome as they could be. And if they decide that I'm not that person and I'm better suited to be on a team or I'm better suited, then then we also do that. So I do think that as a company, I think the managers in the company have to not just be bringing in experienced people, but also developing new talent. You know, whether those new talent make it, I think the lifespan of an agent is three years, the average transaction is like two a year or something, and it's not good, but team leaders have a better success rate because you could feed them for a while while they get their feet under them. So I think there's gonna be a little nuances for back to coaching, back to basics, back to that. I think uh, consumers, they, I don't know if we're going back up to 7%, 8%. I don't think the commission splits are going down, right? I don't think you guys are gonna take less, and I don't think the homeowners are gonna pay us more. So I think as the technology goes, it's up to us to resist that as much as possible. I hate seeing you guys putting it out there at 1% and 2% to the consumer because all you do is, you know, back to this question, is you allow the discount brokers to not be discount brokers anymore. They come in at 2% offering 1% out, you go in at 4% offering 1.5 out. What's the differentiation now in the eyes of the consumer, the buyer's agent, to what was the discount broker and somebody who's offering a full fee and is actually going to make a career out of it? So I'm hoping that you know, together we, 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 we maximize that number four, we provide value so that the consumer will be there. So the fear um, 
is somehow they figure out how to open the doors and trusted advisor without us. You know, think of LegalZoom, right? LegalZoom.com and all that. You can get legal advice from an online website. You get forms and contracts. A lot of attorneys who were just filling the dot and filling the blank contract writers are now working for LegalZoom for a lot less than they were probably making when they just had to draft a divorce decree or something or a very simple, you know, acquisition of something. You know, you can get your forms online for a couple hundred bucks now. So I think I, I fear that root of it. And I think as long as we do our jobs, we're good. I don't think anything for the next couple of years, but we're looking. We're looking a lot at it. Do I see less agents? No, we're still an awesome career. There's still so much business out there, even with the shortage of inventory. So I don't see that. If you were asking where do I see the business in the market, I don't see. We're not 2000, early 2000s. There's so much organic demand. Something that I was going to say, Michael, that hasn't come up in the evolution, Gen Z could end up being the saving grace for the millennials. I, the millennials stuck home. They, I hate to say, I don't want to use the word entitled because they get such a bad rap. They're not bad people. But like, I'm an exer. I'm, I think like one year above them as far as age. But I think they got a bad rap in a lot of the senses of the stuff that they felt like, oh, the boomers, they took everything. You ruined my life. You took all the money. You left me short staffed. You had the bills. I want my college bills paid for me by you guys. But there is a little bit going on right now where like, hey, you know why we have a listing shortage? Because who here's a boomer in the room? I'm not going to say my hand there. Like, you're not moving. You're staying in those houses you bought for very cheap at 2% interest rates. And the millennials are out here going like, you won't sell me your house and you won't move because you don't want to get into the buyer pool and pay you know, over asking on a house and pay 6.5% on it. So you're not moving. You're, and by the way, lumber's down 70%. So like you can fix your house and you have cash and you have equity. And the Gen Z is coming up and there's, they said 44 million people between the age of 26 and, 40, and 35 that are like prime time home buyers. And Gen Z sees it differently. They see not a home ownership in the sense of home and American dream, but rather like that's a way of building equity and worth and value. And they're coming up saying like this, and, and I think the communication, if I can share with any of you as to what you might want to talk, share with the consumer, especially your Zen, Gen Z buyers, your people, you might not find the perfect house. It might not exist. You might not find the house, you, the neighborhood you want, the condition you want, because everybody wants that moving condition, gray on gray with white floors, you know, like HGTV style. Like you might not find that, it might not even be in the neighborhood you want. It might not even be in the town you want. And it might not even be the price you want or the interest rate you want. I keep pointing this my mortgage people on that side of the room. The, um, it might not even be the interest rate you want. Buy it. Because you've got to get your foot in the door. Buying that house in the area you didn't want, that didn't look like the house you wanted, is what's going to afford you the ability to buy the house you want in the neighborhood you want in five years. If you don't do it, you ain't, you ain't getting in the door. And I think Gen Z is getting that. I think they're understanding that like buying something somewhere is going to be a, is a valuable point of life in order to help you out in the future. So I think if you're asking me like with buyers and stuff like communications to the consumer, that and they'd be like, and if the people who aren't moving, like, Florida's nice. It's nice this time of year. It's warm. Like it's okay to move. No, um, we do have to talk to the sellers and say it's a great time to list homes too. And I think we just have an inorganic logjam of sellers who don't want to sell because they don't want to know the buyer pool, but they might have a, a reason to sell. And I and it's certainly not just you know you know, the baby boomers. It's also people like me who basically say, I'm never moving again. My house has gotten small with two kids. But I'm like, I'll just convert my basement to a playroom. Like, uh, you know, we're figuring out ways to not move because I love my 2.5 interest rate or whatever I got on my loan. Like, I don't want to go into that. So that's sort of where we are right now with that. All right, so who in here has the most important question? To Last one. With? <laughs> go for All it. Right, Tim. Hold on one second. We have a recording going. Like, do you see an end to the, to the, uh, to the inventory shortage? It has to be. It has to be, and we're the last state suffering right now, I think. Um, yeah, it has to happen, right? I mean, there's always going to be a, a reason for it to happen. We're the last state. We're already seeing it, like, in D.C. and Maryland and Philadelphia, listing inventories up year over year. Uh, we're down. We're still down, like, 30%, 20-something percent. We're just still in a shortage. Um, and, and honestly, how does it happen? Uh, confidence. I think right now you have a lot of people who work from home, like I work from home for the most part, like I said, I'm not here. You have a lot of people whose businesses and jobs allowed them to work from home, but they haven't made it permanent. So they're like still hanging out here in New Jersey because like they might get called back to the city. They might be called back. And so when their companies decide finally to say, hey, you're permanent work from home, and it's staying that way, we actually downsized our corporate office to feel like we did here, right? We got rid of the second and third floors. We're all down here now. Like that's pretty sure we're staying home at this point. So now, you know, people are moving. Roseanne, who you all just saw outside a couple minutes ago, she lives in Florida. Roseanne doesn't even live here. She's up for a couple weeks and she'll do whatever, but she moved to Florida. Like she now knows 
she's here for, she's gone for good. Like she still can work here, but she's working from, she's not in the room now, she said she was gonna pop down, but she moved. I think as that happens, and as you start to see people's jobs say like, hey, listen, it's a permanent work at home environment, or employers around the world start to say, jobs are gonna be permanent, why are you staying in New Jersey? Right, like not just saying, you say, why are you staying in Tennessee? Why are you staying in Pennsylvania? You're gonna go, like if you love mountains, you're gonna go to Utah, you're gonna go to Colorado because that's where your, your passion is, but your job can still be the job you want, where you want. So I think as we lose our ties to physical locations, I think that that will un well, free up a log jam, but I don't think a lot of people just yet, a lot of companies have said permanent stay at home because I don't think anybody knows how the market would react to that. You know, I, I think there's still some uncertainty. You hear companies saying like, get back to the offices three days a week. Three days a week means you can't move. Three days a week means you need that house in New Jersey still. So until we know that, that you know, what's gonna happen, I think that that'll free it up. You're gonna have organic moves, right? People are eventually gonna retire and move south. People are gonna do that and it will balance out over time. I think rent right now has increased so high. I think that it's getting to a point where you'd rather buy than rent, but I think you started to see in the last year or so rent prices coming down. You know, as rent becomes an option again, the buyer pool will shrink a little bit. The buyer pool shrinking will add days on market to existing inventory, inventory will start to build again. I think there's gonna be a lot of things. Lumber prices coming down right now will probably, you know, spur a lot more construction that it held off when the lumber prices were at its peak. So I think you're gonna see a lot of reasons why it will balance out, it has to balance out. Right? It just, it, it, it always does. You know, not because I say so, but because it will balance. God, I can't imagine Rob. the shortage for this long. Rob. So. You good? You should do more public speaking. Yeah, <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, guys. You